right, so that is the definition of land. We're going to talk about water separately here in just a second, so we'll catch up to that. Air lots uh, typically deal with condos and things of that nature. Let me show you a, a couple little cool things here. Here's one of the things I really like about, <clears throat> well, let me finish this. In these, you, because they are subdividable, you can split them out. So you could rent your air, sell your surface, keep your subsurface. You could rent the subsurface, sell the air, and keep the surface. Keep the air, rent the subsurface, sell the, uh, and you get where I'm going with this. So let me give you a couple of examples of this so that you can actually get the idea of what I'm talking about. One of the funnest ones is downtown at Market and Illinois. All right, the Capitol building sits back here. Blocks building sit here. The Blocks building was converted from the old Blocks retail store to a condo development. The guys that owned the condo development actually decided they were going to build eight more stories on this so that they could obviously gain more revenue. They went through the entire process of getting the permits and all of that to do that. And then they got this wild hair, and you know that this debt had to come from an attorney getting drunk because there is no way a sober, a sober, sane person could think of this idea. Right back here is Senate Street, and the Capitol building is right here. So check this out. These guys went to the historical uh, society in Indianapolis and said, hey, if we build these eight stories, it's going to block the sun from hitting the capital and it will lose its luster and therefore lose value to the public. So here's what we will do for you, Mr. Historical Society. We will sell you our air rights above our building for a million dollars. And the Historical Society went, okay and they bought off on it. Literally, these developers got paid a million dollars to not build condos and sold their air rights. Absolutely hilarious. We're gonna do one more because this is my favorite one of all of them. In New York, there is a Tiffany's building that sits there. And this landlord, bought the building beside it and asked Tiffany's if he, they would sell their building to this young upstart landlord because he wanted to build a skyscraper. And they replied that they were not interested in selling their building and because they had been there for such a long time. So he smartly said, well, will you sell your building rights or air rights above your building to me. And they said, well, certainly if you're dumb enough to buy it, we're dumb enough to sell it to you. So he bought the airspace over their building and built his high rise tower and then went out and put his name on it. Now, I don't know your political beliefs and I really don't want to get into them, whether you like him or not as a president, this was a genius idea, all right? So if you go to the Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue in New York, the Tiffany's building that's sitting inside of the Trump building is not his. It is a completely separate tax parcel that he built over. There's another example real quick, Penn Station. I think Aetna building did the same thing. Penn Station's the subway underground. They bought the surface and the space above Penn Station. And there is a insurance building. I can't remember if it's Aetna or one of those. Irrelevant to the point, same concept. That Penn Station sold their airspace above their building. Tiffany sold their airspace. And Trump used it to build over the top. So you can subdivide these spaces however you see fit, all right? So that's the first definition I wanna talk about was land. 
and what land actually means to you. Now, with land, there is another term called real estate. Real estate is all of the land that we just mentioned, plus any man-made item that is on the property. Septic systems, houses, fences, sidewalks, all of these issues. So the term real estate literally means the physical dirt and earth, and all of the man-made items that come on that. These man-made items in general have a term and they are called an improvement. So here's another sight word for you. The word improvement means a man-made item on real estate. Matter of fact, our purchase agreements actually are called purchase agreements for improved property because it's got house on it. We have a purchase agreement called a purchase agreement for an unimproved property. What do you think the word unimproved means? Means there are no man-made items. Most lay people would call this a vacant lot or vacant land. We call it an unimproved property meaning there are no improvements, no man-made items on it. Farm ground, hunting ground, recreational ground would all probably be considered unimproved if there's nothing on it. So if you're selling vacant land, you would use that specific document called the Purchase Agreement for Unimproved Property, all right? So that is the improvements and that would be called real property. Now, that term, I will tell you, has grown to be widely acceptable as this next term. But you and I need to understand that there is a third version called real property. Real property is the land plus the improvements plus the rights that come with those. This is truly what people want to buy. They want to buy real property because they certainly want the land they would take the improvements that's on it, but they most definitely want the five rights that come with real property. And when you start looking at our contracts that are written by real estate attorneys, you will notice that they use the term real property throughout the contract. Most lay people have come to call real estate this same thing. So in some cases you hear these interchanged amongst people that aren't in the business. For us, we need to understand that real estate and real property truly are two different concepts, all right? Real property includes all of the physical dirt and earth and the naturally occurring plants that are on it, plus any of the improvements that come with it, plus any of the rights. Now, these five rights, you will often hear called the bundle of rights. And each one of them individually is called a twig. And that comes from the old English tradition way hundreds of years ago, when sellers and buyers would convey property the seller used to break a branch off of the tree and he would symbolically hand that branch to the buyer who would accept that branch and that was their method of conveyance. We still do that concept, only instead of a branch now, 
we use this legal document called a deed, which we'll get to in another chapter, but it still is the same concept. The passing of this branch from the seller to the buyer conveys all of these things. So let's go through these five twigs of the bundle of rights. The first one is, and these are in no particular order, disposition. You have the right to get rid of your property any way you see fit. You want to sell it? You can't. You want to put it in your will and give it to an heir? You can't. You want to will it to some foundation? You can't. You want to give it away? You can. You have the right of disposition of your property. You have the right of exclusion. I don't like you guys. I can keep you off my property. I can exclude you from coming on it. Most certainly we have the right of possession. I have the right to be on my property. We have the right of what I'm going to write as quiet enjoyment. Your book writes enjoyment. Quiet enjoyment is a legal term that means you have the right to not be interfered with or hassled about the ownership for any unjust reason. Now, there are just reasons we are going to talk about later. Foreclosure, fail to pay your taxes, those kind of processes actually are for just cause. This is saying that the king can't come and take your land and go, hey, I'm the king, I'm taking your land today, it's not mine, all right? And then the last one, and the one that we will talk about a lot, is control. You have the right of control of your property. You want to paint it purple and per put gargoyles on the roof? Feel free to do that. I see you guys laughing. That actually is a true story. My neighbor in Bloomington, when we lived in Bloomington, had a purple house and had gargoyles perched on the ends of the house, all right? He can do that. All right, he has control of the property. So now the funny thing is we are in chapter two of 21 and I've given you all of your rights. The rest of this book, literally, we are going to talk about how we take away these rights from you. You think you have the right of exclusion? Try keeping the police off of your property. Won't happen. You think you have the right of disposition? Try owning a mortgage that is twice the value of your property. You can't get rid of it. You know, try possess, your possessions, one of your rights. Try not paying your tax bills and see what happens. So the rest of this time, we are going to discuss how we take away all of your rights throughout the rest of this book. So now what I'm telling you is when your favorite buddy comes to you and goes, hey, I wanna buy some land, you need to hear in your head, you really want real property. You want the land, you want anything that's on there like maybe a sewer system or a sidewalk, but you most assuredly want the rights that come with it. So you typically or truly want real property. But I understand what you're saying because that is one of the terms that most lay people misunderstand. And these bundle of rights define the word title. So when someone says, I have title to the property, this is what they are talking about. I possess the rights, which would include the improvements and all of that other stuff and title represents my ownership, and I can convey all the title, which means all of those rights, to a new person through a sale, or a gift, or a donation, or whatever I want to do with it. Now, I wanna go back and catch one other thing. In the um, improvements world, 
when we talk about an improvements, all the man-made items that come with your property, there is another word on page 20. This is another sight word. The word is appurtenance. And appurtenance. And appurtenance is typically, well, it is, and appurtenance is a benefit or a right that comes with the real property. Typically, you hear this word used only when it's not attached to the property. You could say your yard is an appurtenance. That's true. It's a benefit or a right that comes with the property. But since that yard is defined in the definition of land, we don't typically use it in that frame. We use the word appurtenance to mean something that is typically not attached to your physical land, but comes with it. Two really good examples that you will probably deal with in our world. We spoke about the air lot and you selling a condo on the 12th floor. That condo could come with a parking spot. So you sell a condo way up here but it may have a parking spot in the basement that become, that goes with the sale of the property. This would be the appurtenance. It is part of the title that comes or is conveyed with the real property, but typically not attached. They could be 90 feet apart or 900 feet. Another one that you will deal with is this thing called a boat dock. You might own to the edge of the water, but the boat dock comes with the property. So it's not physically on that property, but it is a benefit or a right that comes with it. That too would also be an appurtenance. And you, a lot of times you will hear the term a deeded boat dock. The property comes with a deeded boat dock. So those are appurtenances, and that usually means not attached to the property or not on the property. I have heard attorneys say things like the yard is an appurtenance. Well, yeah, but it's also defined in the land, so we don't typically say it that manner. 